from our Toronto studios. This is the Muslim News on Muslim Network TV. Assalamu alaikum, I'm Zahra Sayyid. Our top story tonight. Officials at Olympia, Washington's Evergreen State College, and students with the Evergreen Gaza Solidarity Encampment have reached an agreement. The Memorandum of Understanding says the public college will work towards divesting from companies that profit from gross human rights violations and or the occupation of Palestinian territories. The administration reached the agreement after the student-led group occupied the students' Red Square on April 26th. Meanwhile, Rutgers University has met most of the demands from the Free Palestine movement by agreeing to continue negotiations over divestment from companies supporting Israel. Rutgers New Brunswick Chancellor Francine Conway says the resolution was achieved through constructive dialogue between protesting students and administrators. She says it opens the door for ongoing dialogue and better addresses the needs of the 7,000 Arab, Muslim and Palestinian students who attend Rutgers. Organizers said the administrators granted all demands except two, which Conway says fall outside the administrative scope. She says that the divestment request is under review. Similarly, Free Palestine organizers at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities' campus and the university leadership announced Thursday morning that they have also reached an agreement to end the days-long encampment on campus. Interim University President Jeff Attinger sent a message to students, faculty and staff just after 7 a.m. outlining the agreement. It includes an opportunity for protest organizers to address the Board of Regents next week about their demand. The agreement also says the university will make a good faith effort to provide as much information as possible about its holdings in public companies. In return, protest organizers will not disrupt final exams that start Thursday or commencement activities over the next few weeks. Demonstrations over Israel's war on Gaza have led to at least 2,000 arrests over the last two weeks, according to a tally by the New York Times. Heavily militarized police officers on Thursday raided the peace camp at UCLA before dawn, arresting 210 students and flattening the camp. Police across the U.S. arrested hundreds of nonviolent students at other universities overnight and on Thursday. The wave of student activism for Free Palestine was sparked by the arrests of at least 108 protesters at Columbia University on April 18th. The grassroots students' movement has multiple local names, no national leadership, but a common demand for universities and colleges to divest from companies that profit from Israel's occupation of Palestine. Israel is accused of apartheid by all major human rights organizations and is being tried at the International Court of Justice for the crime of genocide. Meanwhile, campus action for free Palestine is spreading in Canada as well, with peace camps at Montreal's McGill University, the University of Toronto, the University of British Columbia, and the University of Ottawa, protesting Israel's genocidal war on Gaza. Campus protests have also been reported in the United Kingdom, France, Australia, and the Middle East. Palestine Legal has announced that the Department of Education has launched a federal investigation into extreme anti-Palestinian, anti-Arab, and Islamophobic harassment at Columbia University. Yesterday's announcement comes a week after the advocacy group filed a complaint on behalf of four students and a campus organization. In a statement on X, the organization said, instead of protecting Palestinian and associated students when their voices are most needed to oppose an ongoing genocide, Colombia has taken actions to reinforce this hostile climate in violation of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. On Tuesday, the Department of Education also opened an investigation into the Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. This was after students filed a federal civil rights complaint on April 5th for severe anti-Palestinian, anti-Arab, and Islamophobic discrimination on campus. That was in response to Emory calling in Atlanta police officers to arrest dozens of peaceful student protesters opposing Israel's genocide and the university's complicity in it. Police used tear gas, pepper balls, slammed a professor's head into concrete, and repeatedly tased a black medic after he had already been handcuffed and thrown to the ground. The president of the American Civil Liberties Union says she will no longer be speaking at the City University of New York School of Law's commencement ceremony. Deborah Archer says this is due to the school's decision not to allow students to give speeches at the event. 
repercussions of American universities as crackdowns on student protesters are becoming increasingly evident this week. Faculty members, public speakers, and others who collaborate with higher education institutions have cut ties with schools they say have repressed students' constitutional right to protest against Israel's U.S.-backed war on Gaza. On Thursday, former Columbia University professor Dipali Mukhopadhyay said on social media that she had written to Columbia President Minushi Shafiq to ask that her current affiliation with the university be removed. Mukhopadhyay is still affiliated with the school's Saltzman Institute of War and Peace Studies. She wrote, I have watched with horror as your administration has responded with breathtaking incompetence and inhumanity to peaceful student protest against genocidal violence ongoing in Gaza. Similarly, on Wednesday, End Climate Silence founder Genevieve Gwenther announced that she was canceling her scheduled keynote address on Friday at Columbia's Symposium on Climate and Language. Gwenther says she was deeply ashamed to be associated with the university as a Columbia graduate. Last week, more than 2,000 academics around the world signed a statement expressing solidarity with student and faculty protesters and supporting an academic and cultural boycott of Columbia. Former New Yorker editor Aaron Overbay on Wednesday called on all journalists of conscience to boycott the Pulitzer Prizes, which are administered by Columbia and are set to be awarded next week. At least 141 Palestinian journalists and media professionals have been killed and 70 others injured in Israel's ongoing war on Gaza, the region's media office said on Thursday. In a statement marking World Press Freedom Day on May 3rd, it added that at least 20 journalists are still being held in Israeli prisons. This is part of the genocidal war waged by the Israeli occupation army against civilians, especially children and women in the Gaza Strip, it noted. The media office held Israel and the U.S. fully responsible for the Israeli crimes against journalists and media professionals. It called on the international community to protect Palestinian journalists and pressure the Israeli occupation to stop its genocidal war against journalists, civilians, children, women, and the Palestinian people. Israel stands accused of genocide at the International Court of Justice. An interim ruling in January ordered Tel Aviv to stop genocidal acts and take measures to guarantee humanitarian assistance is provided to the civilians in Gaza. Survey shows black people feel solidarity with Palestinians. Details come after the break. Stay tuned and we'll be right back. Welcome back. The Carnegie Endowment for International Peace released the results of a survey on April 25th, revealing an increased number of black Americans, 45% say they feel connected to Palestinians. That is up from 32% in an October survey. The spike followed Hamas's October 7th attack on Israel. Edward Mitchell, National Deputy Director of the Council on American Islamic Relations, who is black and Muslim, told the GRIO the racial discrimination the racist oppression, the segregation, the apartheid. It all sounds very familiar because there are obvious similarities. Not to mention the similarities between what black people in South Africa experienced and what Palestinians in Israel and in the occupied territories experience. Mitchell said what he, while he believes any American with an open heart who learns about Palestine might sympathize with Palestinians' plight, Americans who have experienced something similar are even more inclined to do so. He also noted that the criticism is aimed at not only the Israeli government, but our government's funding. Israel's war has killed more than 34,000 Palestinians, including women and children. Advocates have been critical of President Joe Biden and his administration's continued military aid to support Israel's war. Swedish authorities have granted permission to yet another protest involving the burning of a copy of the Quran. Police in the southern Swedish city Malmö have issued the permit for the protest to take place at the city's Gustavs Adolfstorg public square Friday, national broadcaster SVT Nieter reports. 
Authorities have not yet decided on two more applications for similar protests this week, one in central Malmo on Saturday and another in Rosengard on Sunday. Quran burning protests in Sweden have strained Stockholm's diplomatic relations with several countries. The Organization for Islamic Cooperation, a coalition of 57 Muslim-majority countries, for instance, has been called on members to take political and economic measures against Sweden, Denmark, and other countries that have allowed the burning and desecration of the Muslim holy book. Such demonstrations in Sweden and Denmark, under the pretext of free speech, have also sparked angry protests and attacks on diplomatic missions in Muslim-majority countries. In response, Denmark adopted a law last December that makes it illegal to burn copies of the Qur'an in public places. Sweden is also considering legal options that would allow police to bar similar complaints over national security concerns. Burmese rebel group Arakan Army has allegedly kidnapped 10 Bangladeshi fishermen from the country's southeastern Okia border with Burma, officials said on Thursday. Chairman of the Rural Council, Ghafuruddin Chaudhry, told Anadolu news agency the fishermen were kidnapped while they were fishing at a channel of the transboundary Naf River on the border. The Arakan Army controlled the border area in question after overrunning Burmese border police who fled to Bangladesh. Talks with the rebels continue to rescue the Bangladeshi victims. Earlier, Bangladesh returned 618 Burmese soldiers and other officials who crossed the border to seek refuge in the neighboring country amid a conflict between the Burmese military and rebel groups in the junta-ruled country. The Pakistan Institute of Conflict and Security Studies has revealed an increase in militant attacks in April, killing 70 people, including civilian and security forces personnel. In a report released Wednesday, it noted that although there was an increase in the number of attacks since March, yet there was a slight decrease in the number of fatalities. In total, 323 attacks took place in Pakistan in the first four months of the year, killing 324 people. According to the report, the number of attacks in Pakistan increased in April after a short-term lull in March. In Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, where 73% of the attacks occurred, the southern districts were the most affected. Other provinces also were attacked, including Balochistan, which saw 16 attacks, as well as Punjab and Sindh. Pakistan has witnessed an increase in militant attacks since the fragile ceasefire between the Pakistani government and the banned armed group Tehreek e Taliban Pakistan, or the TTP, broke down in late 2022. Various extremists and separatist groups also have directed their attacks towards Pakistani security forces and civilians recently. The TTP, affiliated with the Taliban in Afghanistan, aims to establish an Islamic state in Pakistan. The group demands for the release of its members and the abolition of certain policies. Despite numerous military operations against the TTP in the last 20 years, the group continues its violent activities and attacks on civilians and security personnel. Observers say attacks by such groups on law enforcement officials contribute to the demoralization of security forces, creating insecurity in the region. A global coalition of human rights organizations has sounded the alarm over the fates of young men facing imminent execution in Saudi Arabia for crimes allegedly committed when they were minors. In an open letter, the advocacy groups argued that Saudi Arabia's decision to move forward with the executions flies in the face of the nation's planned reforms and international standards. The groups include Human Rights Watch and the World Coalition Against the Death Penalty. The letter focused on seven young men, most of them members of the country's Shia religious minority. All seven have been sentenced to death for crimes allegedly committed between the ages of 14 and 17. The Shia minority makes up about 10 to 15 percent of Saudi Arabia's population, according to the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. The country's specialized criminal court of appeal recently upheld the death sentences of two of these men, Yusuf al Manasif and Ali al Mubayok. Once the Supreme Court rules, the Saudi king will be presented with the execution orders to sign. Execution can occur at any moment thereafter, and per the human rights group's timing, often is difficult to predict. The groups also slammed Saudi authorities for human rights violations experienced by young detainees, including enforced disappearance, solitary confinement for months, and various forms of torture. 
Saudi Arabia has long been criticized for its prolific and public use of the death penalty, including for nonviolent crimes. Last September, Amnesty International Director for the Middle East and North Africa, Hiba Murayev, said in August alone, Saudi Arabia executed four people per week on average. The death penalty is prohibited under international law for drug-related offenses, which do not fall under the category of most serious crimes. Canadian police on Friday arrested suspects believed to be part of an alleged hit squad tasked to assassinate a Sikh Canadian leader, Hardeep Singh Nidjar, outside a Sikh temple in Surrey, British Columbia, in June. CBC News reported that the alleged suspects have played different roles as shooters, drivers and spotters on the day Nidjar was killed at the Guru Nanak Sikh Gurdwara in Surrey. Kamal Preet Singh, Karan Preet Singh and Karan Brar are facing first-degree murder and conspiracy charges in relation to the Nidjar case as per documents filed in a Surrey court on Friday, report said. That's all from our Toronto studios tonight. Thank you for tuning in. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell icon for the latest updates. Your support is needed more now than ever to continue our mission of providing informative, educational and inspiring content to Muslims in North America and around the world. Donate now by visiting muslimnetwork.tv slash donate. For more content, keep watching Muslim Network TV or visit muslimnetwork.tv. Assalamu alaikum and good night.